Yeah, good evening, everyone. Just want to thank everyone for tonight. Are you able to hear me? Okay. Uh, my name is Director of Medici Museum of Art here in Warren, Ohio, and we are super excited to kick our artist talks to Max Markwald. We're really excited to hear about his uh, artistic process and um, talk to him some more throughout his lecture. Um, this lecture will be recorded and shared on our website and Facebook. So if you don't have a chance to join us live, you will have the opportunity to hear about Max's work and himself um, later on. So to get started, I'd like to welcome Max. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Max Markwald and I'm gonna be talking to you today about my painting practice and painting process. Okay, so uh, my painting titled 27 is currently on view as part of the Ohio Arts Council's biannual juried exhibition, which is currently on view at the Medenci Museum of Art now until May 15th. A uh, big thank you to the Medenci Museum of Art for inviting me to speak today, uh, especially a big thank you to Nina and Caitlin for figuring out all the technology parts of this because I'm brand new to Zoom. Uh, so this exhibition, it started off at the Reif Gallery down in Columbus, and then it traveled to Medenci. So I gotta I got make this smaller, so I'm not looking at myself. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, so if you throw my name into Google, what pops up is a lot of large scale realistic oil paintings. I came to portraiture from a conceptual background about Eight years ago, I had the idea to paint anonymous people to look like iconic figures as a way of saying it's the least among us who are the most important in our society. Uh, most notably, I had a painting that from far away, everybody looked at it and said it looked like Molly Ringwald. But once you got up close to it and realized it was an anonymous person, uh, people would say, well, gosh, I, I really thought that was going to be somebody. And that really was the starting point of my uh, paintings. Uh, more recently, I've painted my friends and family dressed as Rosie the Riveter as a way to explore gender. Uh, last year, I painted drag performers and drag kings who use that medium to do uh, political activism and community aid. I've also done a lot of self-portraiture, but I'm not going to get into those today, or at least not conceptually speaking. So every other time I've spoken about my work, it has been from the conceptual point of view. So I'm really excited to speak to you guys today about more of the fun behind the scenes aspect of painting. Now, more specifically, I'm going to be going over two different color palettes and a few different approaches to painting. So all color palettes can be described in terms of how much range they have or how much depth they have, meaning how many different color variations you can get out of a certain set of oil paints. Now, I personally prefer working with a limited color palette, meaning not that many color variations. And I prefer to work that way because then painting becomes an act of expansion. So limited color palette makes painting an act of expansion. Uh, the reason why is, if you only have a certain set of options uh, in your paints, you want to make sure you get each and every one of those options. And what that does is it makes your color mixing and what you're doing on the surface of your painting kind of became a game of pushing the boundaries of what's possible with that color palette. One of the major benefits to working in this way is that you can get pretty bold in your color mixing and on the surface of your painting and know that at the end of the painting, it's still gonna have a certain look, a certain level of cohesion. Okay, so this is uh, one of the color palettes I like to use a lot. 
And this is the color palette I used for all the previous paintings I just showed. The basic structure of it is a white with the three primary colors. So the three primary colors being uh, red, yellow, blue. Those are the primaries because no two colors can mix up to them. Uh, and that's really the important part of this color palette is that it's the white with the three primaries. I tend to use ultramarine blue, yellow ochre, and Venetian red because those are very neutral uh, primary colors. And when you're working with skin, it just really helps to get to that neutral area pretty quickly. So looking at this color palette, say I wanted to open it up, make it more expansive. You know, one thing I could do would be to add in uh, the secondary colors, meaning uh, orange, purple, green. Another thing I could do would be to add in brown, really just adding in any more tubes of paint is going to add, is going to open up and expand your color palette. But say I wanted to take it the opposite direction and make this an even more limited color palette. What I'd want to do is replace the blue with a black. Now that'll just close it up even more if that's the route you're going. I think that kind of, when I talk about this color palette, that really jumps out to people is that I don't paint with any black. And so in order to achieve that, you got two options. Option one is anytime you need to bring a color darker, you wanna mix in its complementary color. So for blue, that would be orange, for yellow, that would be purple, red, and green. And then the other thing uh, you gotta do to get, get the darker areas is you have to mix your own black. And that is just a matter of mixing the three primary colors together. It sounds very simple, but if anyone who's tried to do it, it, it takes a lot of patience to get it to not be, because you don't want it to be any one specific color. You want it to be a pretty true black. So the other thing that jumps out about this uh, color palette is that flake white replacement. So that's the white I use, and that's a really goofy name for a paint color. And so a little history behind that. Uh, back in the Renaissance times, people used to paint with flake white and flake white had an incredible amount of lead in it. Turns out uh, lead is really toxic to paint with. So gambling came out with flake white replacement. It's supposed to have all the same properties as the original flake white. Uh, I don't know if, I don't know if I believe that, but it's definitely the healthier, safer alternative. And the reason why I use flake white is because it would be considered a weaker white. And so what that does is it allows you to retain your color better as you're getting towards lighter areas of your painting. So for example, say I have a really vibrant yellow. If I mix in flake white, it's gonna maintain some of that vibrancy more than if I mix it with say like a titanium white, which is extremely opaque. And I will say this though too, it, the can still says opaque on it. So don't let that throw you off. Okay, so I talked about some of the upsides with the color palette. Uh, the major downside to this color palette is that it adds a lot of time to the front end of your studio day. You know, if you don't have an orange, you have to mix that every day, you know? And so there's just, a, a ton more colors you have to mix up before you even get to the point where you're painting. What I do to combat that is I buy my paint in bulk and I tube it up myself. So it comes in these big cans, as you can see here, and it takes me about a weekend to tube it up. And then it'll last me close to two years. So it it's definitely saves a lot of time and it also it saves an incredible amount of money. Uh, so I'll tell you this though, if, if you're interested in getting into that, definitely YouTube how to get the paint into the tubes because the empty tubes, they're like, they're pretty cheap, but there's definitely a trick to getting them in there without making a huge mess. So definitely recommend YouTube in that. This painting is titled October and I chose to talk about this painting today because it breaks the number one rule of painting hair. <laughs> uh, so like the number one rule of painting hair is don't paint every individual hair. Worry about texture at the very end. Now, 
that works about 99% of the time. But I was going for a very specific kind of buzz cut look, you know, I wanted the scalp to really be showing through. And so what I did is I slowly built up texture and value at the same time. And in order to do that, I painted with a lot of thin layers of oil paint. Another thing that will accomplish is it'll give your painting a sort of really smooth finish and kind of a soft focus look to it. So material wise, how I was able to accomplish this was just linseed oil. Uh, I personally like using only linseed oil uh, with my painting because then there's less I have to worry about. There is this rule in oil painting that goes something like, oh, is it? You want to paint fat over lean. Yeah, that's the way it is. You want to paint fat over lean. So what that means is you want your layers of paint that have more oil in them to, to come on top of layers of paint that have less oil. So what will happen if you don't is your, your painting will just literally fall apart. It's like if you've ever bought like a picture frame or something that has glass on it and there's that film on it that you have to peel off, that'll happen to your oil paint if you don't follow that rule. But if you're just using linseed oil, that's pretty much always going to adhere to itself. So you don't have to worry so much about that. The other reason I like to work that way is because I'm always trying to get away from toxic materials in my studio and I don't use any solvent in my painting. So way back in the day, uh, artists used to use turpentine. They'd use it to thin their paint down while they were painting, to clean their brushes out. Some people would even use it to wash their hands. Uh, but turpentine is, again, very toxic. So definitely don't use turpentine. What a lot of artists switch to today is called Gamsol Odorless Mineral Spirits. Definitely better, definitely safer but it's still pretty toxic. And it's something that, you know, I just don't wanna be exposed to. The vapors are harmful. You shouldn't get it on your hands. If you're mixing it with your paint, it's gonna be breaking your paint down. So it's kind of making your painting weaker. So I just don't like any of that nuisance. So I, I did a lot of research into how to paint without any solvents. And what I came up with is a system where while I'm painting, all I use is linseed oil. When I need to change colors or clean my brushes out, that's also just using linseed oil. Uh, but then the important part at the end of the day, uh, got my brushes and I dip them in poppy oil. So poppy, P-O-P-P-Y, -P -P oil. And what that'll do is it'll keep my brushes fresh until the next time I need to paint. So the next time I need to paint, I just go into my studio, I wipe off the poppy oil and then I'm good to go. And I use poppy oil because that is the slowest drying oil painting medium. When I was doing uh, this research, I came across a video for this product called Geneva Brush Dip. And that product advertises that it'll keep your brushes fresh for up to two weeks. So if that's something that you would, you know, I've never used that because I don't need that amount of time in between painting sessions, but if that's something you're getting into, definitely check that out. Okay, so this painting is in a lot of ways the opposite of the painting I just showed. So the painting I just showed was a lot of thin layers. Uh, this painting is a one layer painting, meaning every part of the surface has only been touched one time. And that is in large part due to luck. <laughs> so I never plan on doing a one layer oil painting. And the reason why I never plan on it is because oil paint dries lighter and duller than when you first apply it. And now this is the opposite of water-based material. So take acrylic, for example. Uh, when you paint with acrylic, as the water evaporates out of it, it dries darker. So oil paints the opposite, which if you're making the switch, it's kind of hard to get used to, but you will. <laughs> uh, so 
Yeah. So the reason why I would never plan on it is because usually, even if I get the drawing aspect of the painting right, I'll need to go back and touch it up. One of the reasons why I didn't have to do that with this painting is because I was working with more opacity. I was applying the paint with more texture and applying it more thickly with less oil. So it, it stayed truer to what it looked like when I applied it wet. Another thing I like to do in painting, especially when I'm working with a painting that's more about texture than being a smooth finish, is I like to have parts of that gray background poke through and it kind of becomes like another color option in my palette. So in the detail there, in between where the shirt and the neck meet, there's this gray line. That's, that's the background poking through there. Uh, this uh, detail is also a good example of how when you're working with a limited color palette, you can get pretty bold in your color choices while it's still looking natural at the very end. So, you know, around the lips, there's parts of that that get really teal, uh, kind of greenish. And then, you know, the neck, there's parts that get pretty lime yellow. And individually, that looks kind of off for skin, but when you put it all together, it's going to look all right. Okay, this is my friend Van, Van in the band. Uh, when I met Van, he was in a band called The Scenic Route. You can find The Scenic Route on Spotify, and they have a hit song called Same Old Ghost, which plays on the radio around Halloween time, plays on uh, 88.9 The Alternation, so got to plug them real quick. Uh, this painting is massive. This painting is uh, six feet by seven and a half feet. I am not that tall, so I need a ladder <laughs> to get up there and paint the top of it. Um, so this approach to painting is a combination of the two approaches I just showed. My first goal with this painting was to build in the midtones as a way of building up the structure. And then I went back and I worked the highlights and the shadows. Now, I'm a bit of an oddball in, in that way. You know, anytime I've, you know, every other artist I know and, and just about every time I've been in a demo or someone's taught me some technique of painting, it's always either work darkest to lightest or lightest to darkest. So I'm weird. I do my midtones first and then worry about the rest at the end. Yeah, that first frame there, you can kind of see what I was talking about how you know it's going to dry duller and lighter and you're going to have to go back you know especially the hair i think you can see it you have to go back and build in those darks and lights so the thing that's different about this painting versus all the paintings i've previously shown is that this painting uses two different color palettes so the skin and the hair is the same limited color palette I've been talking about. But the background and the shirt is CMYK. So cyan, magenta, yellow. I always forget what the K stands for. But if you've ever had to change your printer ink or if you've ever had to pop anything into Photoshop, you've probably come across CMYK. It's like the digital color palette. Now, the major benefit to CMYK is that it can be any color. It's, it's a very expansive color palette. <laughs> the downside is that you can't pronounce any of them. <laughs> um, I could say Hansa yellow. I'm not really going to try on the other two. So yeah, even though this is still only three tubes of paint, because these three tubes of paint have a huge range, this would still be considered a uh, expansive color palette. When I work with this color palette, I tend to use titanium white because that is a stronger white. And uh, this like, so if you ever wanted to paint with sort of almost borderline neon colors, like really highlighter colors with a lot of uh, 
vibrancy, this would be the color palette to do that with. And that's why I like the stronger white is because I feel like when I work with this color palette, I'm always having to tone it down. And I also, when I work with this color palette, tend to mix my own black, but I will also bring in black. So I'll bring in a tube of black, uh, not to make the paint darker, but actually just to make it more neutral. That's kind of the only time I use it with this color palette. So the other downside uh, to this color palette is that the texture of the paint is a lot different than what people are used to working with, or at least I found that. Uh, so for example, take like cadmium red. Cadmium red is a very traditional oil paint and it's known for being really thick. So you uh, squeeze out like a thing of cadmium red and it's gonna, it's gonna have like a lot of texture to it, a lot of stickiness. Um, you know, you're really gonna be able to feel it. I can take this color palette and I can mix up a color that matches the color exactly, matches the hue exactly of cadmium red, but it's not gonna have that same stickiness. It's not gonna have that same texture or body to it. It's gonna be kind of loose and transparent. And because of that, I tend to only use this color palette sparingly or when I come across something that I just need, you know, just need a little bit just to push my regular color palette just a little bit more. So for example, the one, I don't know if you're seeing this as left or right, but I'm seeing it as the one on the far right, <laughs> uh, Jason as Rosie. The only point in that painting I used CMYK was actually on the red bandana just because I needed it to be a little bit more of a cherry red. And that's actually uh, the other major benefit to working with CMYK color palette is that you can get a warm and a cool version of each color. So to call a color warm or cool, uh, it's called the temperature of the color. In just a really general sense, you know, red, oranges, and yellows tend to be warmer. And then you, your blues and your violets tend to be colder. But it's all relative. So you can have a warm and a cool blue. You can have a warm and a cool yellow. And any color palette, you're going to have some variation. So what's unique about the CMYK color palette is that you can get a really vibrant and really distinctly cool yellow and a really vibrant and distinctly warm yellow. You know, you can get that for each color. Usually you would need two tubes of paint for that. So with yellow, people would tend to do like lemon yellow and cadmium yellow. For red, it'd be like a crimson and then a cadmium red for hot. And blue would be something like a cobalt and ultramarine. So, you know, it is is a little bit more expensive, but you do get a bigger range. So that's kind of like the give and the take there. Yeah, and so in that first one, you can kind of see what I was talking about with the highlighter colors, the, you know, where the hair is, where it's yellow, that's, that's pretty vibrantly yellow. Okay, <laughs> so uh, this painting, this approach to painting is the like, oh no, what did I get myself into approach to painting? And it's, it's definitely the painting that I've used the most CMYK with. I went into this painting uh, with the idea that I wanted to have a, like a soft red background. And the reason why I wanted that soft red background is because I wanted the green to pop. Anytime you want a color to pop in a painting, you always rely on its complementary color to get that done. And so in theory, it should work, right? But, you know, in the first panel there, I did it and it looked awful. I hated it. So I was like, okay, I got to got to change it up. Got a new new plan. So then I went with like a soft yellow background. And it definitely looks better, you know, and I was trying to play off the purple. Definitely looks better, but it still just didn't have that same oomph that I was looking for. Third panel. I said I'm going to go bold. So I do dark background, khaki floor and I'm loving it. Like I'm, I'm like, okay, this is it. This is definitely the direction that this painting needs to go. Only problem was everything on the inside of the painting 
was painted as if it was going to be on a light background. And so then the whole rest of the painting was just about like going back and like switching everything over to make it look like it was always intended to be painted on this dark background. So the, this is, uh, like I said earlier, this is the painting I've done the most CMYK in. One of the things I found in doing that is that it's a really sensitive color palette. And so, you know, I said working with a limited color palette feels like an act of expansion. It's the opposite I found with an expansive color palette because any little change in the color feels like it drastically changes what you're working with. I felt like I was constantly having to cut off whole sections of the color palette to try to rein it in and make it look like the colors were supposed to go together. I used to work at a at a wood shop building point of sale cabinetry for theme parks. So if you've ever been to Cedar Point or Disney or Cleveland Zoo and you've gotten your face painted or you've gotten an airbrush t-shirt done, you've done that out of one of these stands. And some of them are complicated and have roofs. Some of them are pretty basic and on wheels, but that's the kind of stuff I used to build. Uh, I started off in the fabrications department and then I got asked to get moved over to the wood shop because I wanted to learn the carpentry side of it. And when I did that, the lead carpenter, Kevin, he's a real great guy. One of the first things he said to me, he came over to me and he said, I've been doing this a long time and, and you're pretty new, but I just want you to know, me and you are gonna make the exact same mistakes and we're gonna make them just as often. The only difference between me and you is that I know how to fix them. And that's what you got to learn. So I love that. And I feel like that really applies to painting. Now, I've been painting for about 10 years now. And every painting, I, I still feel like I'm learning something new that I can bring into the next painting. And something new where I can, like, cover up some bad idea I used to have. Okay, so this painting, this is just a detail of a painting. This is actually probably uh, the best example I have. This is the limited color palette. So this is probably the best example I have of cool, of uh, bold color mixing looking natural. You know, there's a lot of like really vibrant greens and purples and blues in there. But, you know, at the end of the day, it just looks like a hand. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for listening. If you got to the end of this talk, and you're thinking, hey, wait a minute, you said up top that uh, you're a conceptual artist. What, do, what the heck does any of this mean? Well, then I got the video for you. So uh, back in 2021, uh, <laughs> I say that like it's a long time ago. That was just last year. So around this time last year, I had an exhibition at the McDonough Museum of Art. And for that exhibition, I came out with an artist talk video. And that video really goes through the story of my work. So if that's more of the aspect you're interested in, you can find that video by putting my name into YouTube. Or if you find my put my name into Google, my website comes up and then it's also on there. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for listening. And I think we're going to open it up to some questions. Okay, first, I want to thank you, Max. You were an amazing speaker, and we learned so much um, about your process, and your work is absolutely incredible. I'm so inspired because myself, I love portrait painting, but I mean, I learned so many new things. So I really, really appreciate you diving into the process and um, really showing us behind the scenes. Before I ask, I do have some questions for you, but I want to give our participants a moment or an opportunity to ask you. So let me unmute them. I don't know if you could show a video. Oh, okay. If not. So if you want to, you can speak into your microphone or you can type in the chat. Yes. And let me, sorry, I know you brought up the chat. Okay, um, Melissa, I see you have a question. I don't know if you want to personally ask or want me to. 
read it. Sorry, I'm losing the chat. Your work is incredible. How long does it take you to paint one painting from start to finish? A uh, great question. I don't have a satisfying answer for you. So I usually tend to say I paint between 12 and 20 paintings a year. That roughly equates to one to two paintings a month. But the way I paint is I always paint in batches. And so it's kind of hard, you know, like I'll build six canvases and then I'll do the drawings of those six canvases and then I'll do the backgrounds, you know, and I, I build them all up kind of at the same time. So I might go three months without finishing a painting and then one day, boom, I've got six finished paintings. Um, but yeah, the simple answer is somewhere between uh, 12 and 20 paintings a year. Okay, that's incredible. That's a lot of paintings um, within a year time frame. Uh, another question came in, are you local to the Youngstown area? Where, where do you live? Where are you from and where's your studio, I should say? Yeah, so uh, I was once told that I'm more Akron than LeBron. Uh, my doctor told me that, uh, but I'm actually I'm actually in Cleveland now. I moved up to Cleveland, but from Akron. I went to the University of Akron. I worked at the Akron Art Museum for eight years in various positions. Loved working there. Loved that museum. My studio used to be at the Summit Art Space, which is across the street from the Akron Art Museum. But right now, um, I, actually, like right before the pandemic, I moved up to Cleveland because, you know, everyone was doing it. So, uh, you know, <laughs> followed all my friends up here and then everything shut down. But currently, uh, my studio is one of the bedrooms of my two bedroom apartment. Okay, another question. Do you do any workshops? But I will say, if not, you're welcome to have one at Medici. <laughs> we would love to have you. <laughs> I personally wanted to take uh, your workshop, but do you host any workshops? Yeah, so I think the short answer is not consistently. I did do a workshop for Bay Arts. I did like a, it was called Non-Traditional Approaches to Portraiture. And it was my first workshop. And I think I was maybe a little over ambitious and like wanted to teach everyone everything. And uh, so I've, I've learned from that. Um, but I do occasionally, like right now I have uh, my good friend, I'm giving them sort of private lessons once a week just to like, you know, kind of help them out. And that's been fun. But yeah, short answer, not consistently. Okay. Okay. I have a question. Um, well, first, um, your talk was really awesome. And I was wondering, because I, I, I'm a huge fan of your work, I was wondering what your kind of like artistic inspiration is, like how you, um, like, do you take photographs of your subjects or like you know, self portraits first and then like work from a photograph. How do you start making a painting? Like what, what is your first thought? Uh, yeah, so <laughs> my first thought with a painting with portraiture is I usually have some larger conceptual goal. So, you know, and I do a lot of self portraiture partially because I don't have to schedule myself. I don't have to worry that I'm not gonna show up that day, but I start with uh, drawing and then I and then I kind of move to photography. A lot of my work tends to veer into what people would consider photorealism. And I, I do, that's definitely where I started. I get, I'm more stylized now, but I do work from a photo. And especially like I've done paintings that I just draw. Um, and then I've done other paintings, especially when I'm working really big. I, I like to use a projector to get the composition but all the like internal structure and all the like internal anatomy, that's stuff that I just had to learn from drawing. And way back when I was first, you know, setting out into portraiture, I would try to draw a portrait every day, you know, just to get, just to build it up. So it was like secondhand nature. And the other reason what like, that's like, I highly recommend that to anybody doing portraiture because now, you know, if I get into a photo and I like, I liked the pose for some reason, but there's some like awkward area where it's like, oh, they like, you know, kind of like a weird pose, you know, then I know the anatomy and I can switch it and make them look natural. Uh, so I think that answers your question. Um, if not, I can take another go at it. No, that's great. Um, another question came in. 
what artists, which artists do you admire and seek inspiration from, you know, in your own work that have influenced your own work? I'm sorry. Yeah, so I think um, sort of mentally, like how I uh, am in my studio space, uh, the artist that's probably influenced me the most was Paul Henry Ramirez. Uh, and he is someone who I worked with at the Akron Art Museum. He had a, um, uh, what's it called? Installation. Yeah, so he had like a site-specific installation. And it was one of the, I was at the time working as an exhibition tech. And so he like really taught me how to like build up layers of paint over tape in a way that's extremely meticulous, but it gets a really crisp line. And that, even though that's not something I do in my work, that's really stuck with me, like the amount of care and attention and time that goes into something that seems really simple. Another artist that's been really influential to me is Alyssa Monks. And you know, if you don't know them, please find them on Instagram. So when I was a super senior, I was like, it took me a long time to graduate. So one of the years I was a super senior at the University of Akron, uh, we developed uh, a painting league. So it was like a student organization. And so we got to pick an artist to come in and that was like a huge stressful thing. And like, none of us knew what we were doing, but we ended up getting Alyssa Monks to come. And her talk was like all about grit and all about uh, not being good at painting, but focusing on what you have to do to get to where you want to be rather than focusing on where you're at. And her work's amazing. And it also got me interested in the New York Academy of Art because that's where they went and got their MFA. And so I was looking on there and I got, um, I saw that they have what's called the Summer Undergraduate Residency Program. It's a month long program. You get to spend it in New York City. And I ended up getting to do that a couple of years later. And that really opened uh, my eyes to like a lot of different artists and people and uh while I was in New York that time, I got to see a uh, Kahindi Wiley show, who's just an amazing artist. And uh, I actually, I've gotten to see, Carrie James Marshall is a great artist. I got to see his solo show uh, once in Chicago and once in New York. And that was really fascinating c coming from like a curatorial perspective, how it seemed like, you know, it was the same body of work, the same paintings, but seemed like two completely different shows. Um, yeah, so that's a, that was a lot of people. So I think those are my interests. Sorry, I'm just bringing up the chat. A few more questions, Max. How do you market yourself and what advice would you give to an inspiring artist on how to get into the business? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, I feel like I'm an oddball there too because I do not like social media at all. I don't like being on it. I, I have to have it. I will respond to it, but more and more, I try to not be on social media as much as possible. I got my start really by just applying to juried shows at the Summit Art Space and all the places around Akron. And that was really beneficial. And I would say, you know, people gave me this advice and I feel like I'm just now starting to take the advice or just now starting to realize it's really good advice, but always like the best way to get your foot in the door in a place is to go to their openings and meet people. And I would say every opening you go to, you should meet somebody new to the point where like you remember their name and you remember something interesting about them, you know? So like that kind of learning how to network, I think is really important in the art world. What was that other Sorry, we have a question um, we wrote down. Oh, okay. You showed us throughout your process how you work in um, different portions, but where do you choose the start? It, for example, on your self-portrait, it looked like you started near the forehead, but wh what, um, why do you, like, where do you start on your paintings and do you ever go back and rework? Because it looks like from each section, you almost work to completion. Am I correct? I don't know. That was a payment. 
No, I just I just showed the paintings where I got it right the first time. No, I definitely have to do a lot of reworks. Um, there's definitely times uh, where I probably should have showed at least one like that. But there's definitely times where I like do something. I'm like, whoa, that's that's wrong. And I got to go back and redraw it. But I tend to start with the background. And if I want to get really particular about a painting, I'll take the background color and I'll put it in its own tube of paint. And then as I'm painting the rest of the painting, I mix in that background color and it'll make it look like it's really like set into that atmosphere of the painting. It's, it would be kind of like deciding what the color of the light is, you know? So if you have like a warm light or a cool light, so that's, that's uh, usually my starting point. And then I, depending on what's going on with the shirt and the hair, I usually do those next. And I tend to do the forehead down. And the, the reason why I do that is I like to work what is uh, the least muddy colors down to the muddiest colors, meaning like your forehead is going to be where you can most clearly see your skin tone, whatever your skin tone may be. And then as you go down, there's going to be more shadows, more complicated stuff. Your, you know, your blood's going to pull on your cheeks. So that's going to be a little redder and it gets like, you know, less and less sort of simple. And so that's why I start with the forehead and work my way down. Thank you. <laughs> okay, one last question before we conclude our artist talk. Um, when you were talking about CMYK um, with color, do you mix your own black or do you use, do you recommend using it out of a tube, mixing your own? And do you think black is too overpowering in a painting? So I think the short answer is it depends on what you're painting. Like if you are trying to make something look like super black, then yeah, use a tube of black. But because uh, most of my work is figurative, uh, figurative just meaning there's people in it, um, it's, it's, it's uh, the black ends up looking really harsh. And so I always mix my own black. Even with the CMYK, I mix my own black and it will take, it takes a lot of patience. And if I'm working with CMYK and I ever bring in a tube of black, it's never to, um, excuse me, it's, it's never to make the paint darker. It's only to neutralize it, right? Because that's such a vibrant color palette. Sometimes you need to get it more into a neutral zone. That's the only time I use black in my painting. Well, thank you so much, Max, for answering all of our questions and being here tonight. You were fantastic and we really, really enjoyed hearing about your process and more about your work. And um, through Max's Artist Talk will be posted on Facebook, Instagram, and on Medici's website. So if you missed tonight's Artist Talk, please check out um, those three social media uh, channels as well as our website. And we will also include a link to Max's um, artist webpage. So we do encourage you to come out and see the exhibition. It's on display here at Medici Museum of Art in Warren, Ohio until May 15th. And come see Max's uh, work in person because it is truly incredible uh, to see it uh, in person. So we do encourage you to come out and thank you again, Max, for being here. All right, have a good night.